Hello, and welcome to the Waves webinar series. My name is Yoni, and I'm the moderator. Can't see me, but I'm here working behind the scenes to help make sure everything runs smoothly. Today, we're going to be talking about some of our newest live tools, focusing on the WSG Y16 I.O. card for Yamaha mixing consoles, powered by SoundGrid technology. Our presenter, Ken Pooch Van Druten, is going to walk you through it all. But before we get started, I'm going to take a minute and go through the format of the webinar for anybody that hasn't done one of these before. The webinar will last about 30 to 45 minutes and has two parts to it. The first half will be a short presentation from Pooch, where he's going to give a general overview and explain the concept behind SoundGrid and the Y16 card. One thing to take note of is that there won't be any audio demonstrations during the webinar, as the webinar software itself is not set up to stream audio at this time. The second half of the webinar will be an open Q&A. Feel free to submit any questions you have related to the topic, and based on how much time we have, we'll try and answer as many of them as we can get to. You can send your questions at any time, but you won't see them right away in the chat, as they'll first go to me, and then I'll feed them to Pooch one at a time. And on that note, let me hand things over now to our presenter for today, Lincoln Parks, front of house engineer, an expert at navigating between the studio and the stage, as his live recording mix for the song What I've Done was nominated for a 2010 Grammy. Please help me welcome Ken Pooch Van Drew. Hey everybody, how are you? Is this thing working? <laughs> yeah, you're on. Um, coming to you, <laughs> coming to you live uh, here from uh, lovely Burbank, California. Uh, we're out on the road right now, so um, uh, we're broadcasting live here from Burbank. Um, you know, uh, like Yanni said, my name is Ken Pooch Van Druten. My friends call me Pooch. Um, I uh, I've had over 20 years of experience in the live sound industry as a. I was really honored when Waves uh, approached me about uh, being their first uh, live product specialist. Uh, do some consulting for them and, and speak to them about um, really entering into the live sound market. Um, you know, Waves has traditionally been a studio-oriented uh, uh, software company, and uh, now they're doing this big push into the live sound industry and providing plugins on several platforms, um, which is really exciting um, for all of us live sound guys. Uh, you know, we've known for a lot of years that Waves plugins were, uh, you know, awesome records you know I've used them a long time with Pro Tools and, and some other platforms uh, in the record uh, part of this industry but in the in the live sound industry it's taken a little bit for them to to catch up with us but now that they're here it's really exciting uh, uh, what we can do um, I think that we need to talk a little bit about the history of plugins and that kind of things because people may you may not be um, Familiar with plugins per se, uh, especially if you're a Yamaha user, you may not have had any experience with plugins before. DigiDesign uh, platform provided plugins uh, about five years ago, but now uh, Waves has moved forward here and, and is able to provide their plugins on on some other platforms. Um, specifically, we'll talk about the uh, the WSG Y16 card and how that incorporates with the uh, with the uh, <clears throat> sound grid system so let's talk a little bit about history of plugins um, you know uh, the the plugins that y if you're not familiar with plugins basically it's a software based um, thing that uh, you can use dynamics and processing um, uh, via software uh, to to do uh, you know compression and EQ and uh, you know reverbs and that kind of thing, um, and, and what this does for us is it eliminates a lot of things. You know, previously uh, we were carrying around uh, a lot of gear with us, uh, we were carrying around racks and racks full of uh, analog gear and favorite uh, you know dynamic uh, compressors and, and that kind of things, which were taking up you know eight spaces in a rack, that kind of thing. So, what plugins have done for us. Uh, is really provided a, a, a way to have um, a bunch of um, 
processing in a, in a small amount of space. So, you know, some of the benefits that, that we get from plugins are uh, the fact that we have, we don't have all this cabling going on between various racks. And some of the things that we don't, we didn't have previously with some of the analog gear is stuff like total recall, where you can recall the the uh, settings you have on plugins. Um, you have preset use. So, uh, for instance, if you uh, have your favorite setting that you have um, with with plugins uh, on an EQ or a compressor, uh, you can have that recallable very fast. Um, I have. Uh, you know, a, a preset library that I kind of carry with me um, that uh, gives me a starting point uh, when I come across to start start doing uh, doing gigs. I'll bring, you know, I'll start with if it's a brand new band I've never worked with. I'll start with the 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 plugins that I use normally in in a chain. You know, so let's say I have a gate and a compressor and a Q. And those three plugins I'm using, um, I generally use those same plugins on the same kind of inputs. So on a kick drum, for instance, I would use those kind of uh, three settings. And now with the ability of preset use, I can plug those presets in there and have a starting point, um, and it makes things go a lot, a lot quicker. So that the setup time that's happening with plugins is a lot faster. So. Um, as you uh, get familiar with plugins and, and start using them, um, you, will, you will see that uh, there's a lot of benefits uh, to, using, to using plugins. Um, I know that, you know, speaking with some live sound guys that are unfamiliar with that, um, you know, it's a little bit daunting to be, you know, working on stuff on gear you haven't used. But um, I really do feel like um, that this is... Uh, a tool and and a a place that the is the future of live sound where you know uh, we really are going to be uh, using all of our effects and all of our um, compressors and, and things uh, in in a uh, software based kind of format. Uh, so uh, it's something that we need to embrace as live sound people. Um, we are and. Exciting thing um, is that Waves is, is uh, coming up with you know this this sound grid format. Um, let me give you a brief overview of what sound grid is. Um, we'll come back and we'll talk about it. But but basically, it, it's an ability to use Waves plugins uh, currently right now on the Yamaha platform. Uh, any Yamaha console, um, PM5D, uh, L7. All of those are M7. Um, all of those consoles that currently have a uh, card slot in them uh, will accept this um, Yamaha, uh, or sorry, Wave Sound Grid. Um, so we'll come back and we'll talk about what that is. Um, but I, I want to, I want to also express like some, some things that I have been using. Um, you know, in, in plug-in land that makes things quicker and, and give you some real-world experience that I've had uh, in my plug-in experience. Um, you know, I, I currently, um, I mix Linkin Park, their live sound, but I also mix all of their live releases, any sort of recording. So we record every sort of, sh every show um, to a multi-track HD system. Um, and then I spent some time working in um, a dressing room, uh, you know, mixing all of that stuff for their release. And along with that, um, I got an opportunity to mix, you know, a, a live DVD for them and that kind of stuff. So the, the, the lines between live and studio have been really blurred uh, these days. And it's kind of come full circle for me. I started as a... Uh, a recording engineer in this business and then went to being a live sound. So the, uh, the lines between those two things are, are really uh, becoming blurred and plugins are a major part of that. Um, you know, I find that uh, in the live sound genre, I use the same plugins that I use also uh, to, to do the mixing of the recorded version. And along with that comes all of the things like what I talked about earlier with presets and that kind of thing. Uh, usually the, the presets that I have going on in live sound carry over into the 
uh, recorded and mixed version of that. Um, this is pretty exciting. It makes things pretty quick. Um, literally take a USB key with me and some presets on it. And, uh, that's, uh, that, that's pretty exciting stuff. So um, I'll, I'll give you one other story just uh, so you can kind of see how, uh, how much of a tool, you know, plugins are. Um, I was uh, working on the Lincoln Park, uh, they have a Transformer 2 um, song, and uh, we did a premiere for Transformer 2, and they recorded it, and we were going to release it as a, as a single. Um, and so I was working um, and trying to get the bass tone that was on this uh, record. What was unusual about it was the bass tone was pretty different um, than anything they had done before. So I was trying to get the tone, and I just really, I couldn't get it. It was, um, uh, you know, I tried different plug-in chains, nothing was working. So what I ended up doing was calling the, uh, the engineer of the record and saying to him, asking him what his plug-in chain was. Um, and uh, he, he sent me his plug-in chain, so then I plugged that in, which was great. Um, and it came up, and it, and it just, it still wasn't right. Uh, so I called him back and I said, listen, I just, I still can't get the tone that you have on the record. And I said, can you send me your presets? And so he did. Um, he emailed me his presets. I plugged those presets into the uh, plug-in chain that I had previously. And I ended up with something very close, very similar to what was on the record. I had to do a little bit of tweaking, but um, that's pretty exciting. The, the interaction that we can have between a recording engineer, a producer, uh, and a live sound guy to produce um, live sound that sounds just like the record is pretty exciting. So uh, that's one little kind of real life story uh, that, that I've experienced in the, in the plugin land. So if you're new to plugins, um, you know, uh, check it out. It, it, it's a pretty exciting thing. Um, Hey Yanni, can we bring up the uh, the Y16 card shot so you guys can see that? Um, so let's talk about what exactly SoundGrid is and what's going on here. Um, SoundGrid is uh, a technology that um, Waves produced that and and designed. Uh, to provide low latency uh, communication between Yamaha consoles and uh, Waves plugins. Um, this, what you're seeing here, is the card that actually fits into the card slots um, of Yamaha consoles. It's the WSD Y16 card, and currently uh, the it supports two cards. Um, each one of these cards provide you uh, 16 inserts worth of uh, information on a uh, Yamaha console. Um, and that's all routable through the console itself. Uh, it shows up as uh, any other card would, a Dante card or an input-output card. It shows up in the routing of the Yamaha console. And so that gives you the ability to have 16 inserts per card. So if you put two of these cards <clears throat> into um, a... Uh, into Yamaha console, you end up with 32 total inserts of Waze plugins. Uh, and then uh, we'll get into the software a little bit later, but not only can you have those inserts, but the, then the ability uh, to have multiple plugins on each of those inserts um, is pretty exciting as well. Um, Yanni, let's bring up the PowerPoint and uh, talk a little bit so that you guys can really see what's going on here. The <clears throat> The, the whole system is this. Uh, there are, are uh, several things involved here, hardware pieces, okay? It is um, the Y16 card, then a uh, server, uh, which all of the processing for the plugins happens on this server, then uh, a standard switch that connects all of those things via Ethernet technology, and, uh, and then a control uh, computer laptop. So if we look at it, let's just have a look here. Let's see if I can do this. Cool. 
So uh, this is a PowerPoint that we developed just so that you can kind of see stuff. Obviously, it, it just talks about what PowerPoint is. Um, so uh, like I was saying, it starts with uh, the plugin server here, uh, which is a standard Intel dual quad uh, server. Uh, Waves really wanted to make sure that this technology was used with uh, uh, devices that are off the shelf kind of things. And, you know, we spent a bunch of time talking about uh, redundancy and how, you know, traditionally they've been a, a studio company. So they needed to understand that in our world of live sound, we don't have time when gear breaks down. So we need to talk about redundancy and we need to talk about um, you know, stuff being off the shelf hardware pieces um, so that when we're in Moscow and the rack falls off the back of the truck, have uh, the ability to go to a computer store and buy the things we need to make that show still work. So uh, this plugin server is a standard uh, Intel dual quad server straight off the shelf. This is where all the DSP happens for the plugins themselves. Um, so uh, what Waves has done is they have taken a standard um, Intel server and placed it inside the chassis if you're familiar with uh, a Max BCL that Waves makes, they put it inside this chassis that is um, pretty bulletproof. Uh, I've been dragging around one of these, uh, doing demos and that kind of thing all around the world. I drug it to Australia recently. Uh, and the chassis that they built for it is, uh, is great. Um, now, if you don't feel like you want to buy the, the server, you know, Waves doesn't really want to be a hardware company. Uh, they've built this server so that um, you have the ability to buy all the things from them and make it a simple integration. But if you did, you know, you, they have the ability to go and buy, purchase your own Intel uh, server, and it will work just fine uh, based on uh, the software that Waves can provide you. All of that stuff is kind of on the Waves Live uh, website which they've just updated recently. So if you haven't been there uh, recently, definitely go check it out because it kind of goes through the whole thing of uh, the tools that you need, for this, et cetera. So anyway, it starts with the server. Uh, the next thing is a switch, a standard off-the-shelf switch, uh, the thing you can go to your local computer store and buy. Uh, it's a gigabit switch. Uh, and then... Um, there is the SoundGrid controller. Now, the SoundGrid controller can be any laptop. <clears throat> what I use is my laptop that I carry around with me uh, to do all my other stuff, check my email. And that. Uh, it is not where the DSP is, is happening. It's not where the processing is happening for the plugins. The processing is happening in the server. So the, the, the laptop doesn't particularly have to be anything, you know, super fast. Uh, it can be a standard laptop, Mac or PC. Uh, all it is is the place that controls all of the uh, server uh, information, DSP server stuff. And then finally it is uh, the WSG uh, Y16 card. Like I told you before um, the, you can have up to two cards in, in Yamaha consoles right now. They currently support two cards. That's 32 uh, inserts. Um, and all of this is connected via regular Ethernet uh, technology. So all of the hardware pieces except for the card itself, the WSG Y16, are all off-the-shelf computer products that you can uh, purchase at any store, which is, uh, that's, that's exciting. You know, the, the ability to be able to recover from a catastrophic, you know, uh, breakage <laughs> uh, is invaluable for us out on the road. So there you have it. That's the basic um, kind of setup of what SoundGrid is. Uh, so you can get an idea of what's going on there. Um, in the future, we're talking about a scaled up system uh, where you could have more servers, more cards, you know, that kind of thing. This is a future thing coming. Uh, like I said, right now it supports only 32 inserts at the moment. Uh, but the idea is, you know, there's a lot of talk of, of um, what's going to be happening in the future with this. Uh, and the expansion of this is, is going to be really exciting. Um, so uh, if we look at the, the features of it, um, it, 
the most important thing about this is that what what Wave set out to do here was to produce something that had the lowest latency. Uh, talk about latency, it's a major issue when you're talking about plugins and that kind of thing. Um, you want to want to make sure that you can get the lowest latency in the hardware prior to adding all of the plugin stuff. And um, Waves, for about two years, waited for someone to produce that technology, and nobody was doing it. Uh, you know, some of these other cards, Dante cards and some other stuff, uh, just weren't, uh, they weren't low enough latency that Waves felt like they needed to have for the hardware part of it. Um, so Waves developed their own technology. It's their own Ethernet packet technology that uh, sends information over. So what that means is you start with um, the hardware portion of this is less than a millisecond of latency. Uh, 0.8, I believe, is what the uh, latency is on it. Um, as you add more and more plugins, then you start uh, obviously adding plugins into the thing. But if you're starting with the hardware portion of it already being 0.8, um, that's a great starting point. So anyway, uh, there's some more information here, as you can see. You know, all of this information is posted on the Waves Live, so you guys can have, go have a look at it after this is over. So more about what we talked about. Uh, let's, the, the plugin stuff is, is pretty amazing what they've done here. Um, you know, we talked about the future and talking about what what we're going to get into, um, but currently, right now, it's pretty amazing the amount of DSP that is allowed with the system that they've built. If you look in the bottom there, there's a plugin instances. Uh, they're talking about benchmarking plugin instances at 48k. Um, the what they did was they took 184 C4s, and I don't know if you're familiar with that plugin, but it's a pretty hefty plugin. Uh, and they were the, they had the ability to run 184 C4s on this uh, DSP with no problems uh, and ran it for weeks uh, and so um, you know us using 184 C4s on a uh, uh, 32 inserts is unlikely. <laughs> so the point is is that there is plenty of DSP for future things coming up uh, as well as anything that you can dream up now. Uh, so that gives you some some idea of, of just how much uh, technology this is and how you know, how well they thought out this DSP they've come up with. Uh, if you go to 96K, it has all those things, but still you have 82 C4s available or 104 SSL channels. Uh, so that's that's a bunch of stuff. Uh, so um, here's a kind of a picture so you can get more of an idea of uh, what's going on with it. Uh, you have your laptop control uh, going to the switch, also the the uh, card going to the switch, and the server going to the switch, all via Ethernet. You'll see there's a little um, kind of uh, arrow there that shows MIDI control. What they've done is they've put a, uh, a MIDI port in their card, and if you connect uh, the MIDI out of a Yamaha console into the MIDI in of this card, it gives you snapshot recallability via MIDI. They've, they've really created with the software a really neat piece of software that allows you to control um, all of the functions of uh, plugins um, via MIDI. So as you recall snapshots in your Yamaha console, you can also be recalling uh, snapshots in the uh, multi-rack software. And um, you know, it really opens the doors to have all kinds of stuff happen. So even if you had only 16 inserts, if you had the, uh, the single card, um, with the snapshot recallability, you could really do some creative things uh, as far as putting, uh, you know, making one song be a reverb and the next song be a delay simply by, by using uh, snapshot recallability. Uh, so it, it, it really is versatile and, and gives you a bunch of, of choices. Um, so... That's the multi-rack SG. Um, let's look at, Yanni, if you could bring up the uh, screenshots of some of what uh, the multi-rack stuff is, uh, we'll have a look at that. The actual piece of software that Waves developed, their own software, is a thing called multi-rack. And multi-rack is uh, a, um, let's see if we can, huh. 
So Yanni, I'm not seeing it show up here. Maybe it takes a minute. Uh, ah, there we go. <laughs> and there it is. Okay, so multi-rack software is a pretty neat uh, piece of software that Waves has developed. And this is the control area um, of, of the, uh, the sound grid thing. Um, so each one of these racks, uh, per se, has the ability to have eight Waves plugins uh, in, in each of the racks. So on each of these inserts, let me see if I can get a pointer here. Um, over here to the left, you'll see uh, that's the input side of the rack, and then over here is the output side of the rack. Um, and uh, you uh, place plugins. Uh, in any sort of order that you want here. You can have up to eight Waves plugins in each of the insert points. Uh, it's really a smart piece of software. Uh, so uh, this kind of gives you just a, you know, a couple screenshots of what's going on here. Um, I urge you definitely to go kind of experiment it with yourself and, and get a piece of software and mess around with it. But it's very intuitive how they've built. Um, it makes sense. Uh, even someone coming from just an analog world You'll understand uh, how you can place plugins in orders and move plugins around and show up. Um, so you'll see that you know here's here's plugins, uh, three different plugins in order. As you double click on one of the plugins, then you get this window right here, which brings up uh, all of the controls for the different plugins. Um, here's a shot of the. Uh, shot of where you you would have eight plugins uh, if you were going to use that many plugins, <laughs> um, and uh, here's just a little shot of um, some of the routing ideas that you can do. You know, starting obviously with a mono send and then have it return as a stereo, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, you know, it, it's really a, a, a smart piece of software thought out um, very well. And very intuitive, you know. I mean, uh, the first time that I used it, uh, I was moving around in it uh, the first 15 minutes of figuring it out. Um, you know, right now, um, uh, Kevin Tater McCarthy uh, is the monitor engineer for Lake Park. Uh, we're also doing Slash right now. Um, and I, I had the, the prototype for this, and we brought it out to um, a rehearsal session for Slash. Um, and we, you know, we plugged it into a bunch of stuff and, and Tater had never seen, uh, the software before. Um, and literally he was up and running in about, you know, 10 minutes of me just showing him around where stuff was. Um, and, uh, what was exciting about that is we, you know, we plugged in a bunch of plugins. I think we used, a, um, uh, let's see, I think we used a, a SSL compressor and an L2. I can't remember what the third plugin was, but anyway, on some uh, ear mixes, and uh, he just put them on the output side of his ear mixes, um, and we were doing insert in and insert out stuff um, with uh, Miles Kennedy, um, the lead singer, and and he was it was it was pretty dramatic, uh, you know, punching an insert in and going wow, having the ability to have this a mix bus compressor ears is, is pretty exciting. So uh, we did that um, for one rehearsal and uh, Tater the next day uh, purchased a 32 input, uh, 32 insert uh, sound grid system. <laughs> he was sold. He bought the company. So uh, anyway, um, uh, I think that as you guys get into this and you see this and, and it starts showing up, you're going to have the same kind of experiences. Um, it, it's just a matter of getting this out uh, into the public and people trying this, you know, because as soon as you do, you will see how, how exciting this is, um, how much it will improve your mixes uh, as well as just inserts and how much it improves your sound. Um, let's go one down here and we'll just talk about a little bit about this latency thing we were talking about earlier, how the hardware portion of this is a low latency uh, thing will also in the software itself it gives you all kinds of options to adjust latency uh, so that you can uh, you know have the ability to run all of your channels uh, at the same latency so you don't have any sort of phasing issues uh, so there's this there's a preferences 
portion of the software that allows you to not only manually adjust latency, but also have it auto adjust latency, et cetera, et cetera. So as you get further into the software, um, I just wanted to point out to you that the ability uh, to, to uh, have control over latency is there. Uh, it was given to us in the software. Um, so uh, let's talk a little bit about the future and then I wanna take your questions because uh, that's important to me that we get some interaction here. Um, the uh, Yanni, if you could bring up the uh, future networking. Um, so the, the future of this is, is awesome. Um, the, right now we're talking about this sound grid technology that exists with the Yamaha consoles. Um, and the reason they went to Yamaha consoles first was because there's so many of them out there. Uh, so many people use them. And we all know that the Yamaha console is it's a workhorse. It's, it's already a great sounding console um, and you can drop the thing off the back of a truck, but you add this into the equation, you put um, SoundGrid into the equation, you've really turned uh, the, the console into, um, you know, a, a Yamaha on steroids. It's really uh, a great thing. And I, and I think it brings the PM5D up into the range of competing, uh, you know, with DigiDesign profile and um, some other platforms that are out there. Um, but the real idea here for Waves is not only to be part of Yamaha, but to be part of other companies so that um, the ability to have Waves plugins on all uh, different platforms would be invaluable to some to people like us. So uh, let's say for one day you're on a DigiDesign console, uh, and the next day you're on a M5D, and the next day you're on a Digico, um, the ability to have all of those kind of uh, plugins or have the ability to have Waves plugins on all three of those platforms uh, is exciting. Um, so coming soon is uh, the Digico uh, platform. Uh, it's supposed to be released this summer. Uh, the same format, what we've been talking about, um, uh, SoundGrid with a server uh, and having the ability to have the control within uh, the uh, console itself, uh, so it eliminates the laptop portion of this, uh, and control happens uh, in the Digico console itself, uh, along with some other platforms uh, coming soon. Um, so, like I said, it, the, the thought process here is for you to be able to carry your Waves plugins and your presets with you to any sort of platform that any of us want to use. You know, previously to this point, it's been just DigiDesign. But now uh, we're now certainly with Yamaha, Digico, and then some other platforms coming soon. On top of that, let me just talk about, you know, the future that we have. Uh, the thought process is this. Uh, if you can see this diagram here, it is uh, a diagram of what we kind of want to do for the future. Uh, and the, the thought process here is that the ability to have um, two servers on stage um, and be sharing DSP between front of house monitors and the record truck uh, and the ability to have all of those uh, people be sharing Waves plugins, uh, have control over individual parts of their plugins, and also um, have the ability, since it's a network, have the ability to have um, uh, be able to send presets amongst each other. So the record truck uh, says, you know, hey, uh, let's listen to the kick drum. Oh, I'm not quite getting it. Uh, it's the front of house engineer over the network. I can send him my preset and say, here, this is what I'm doing in front of house. Check it out. So this is all things that we're talking about in the future is having the DSP on stage, living on stage, and having everyone sharing that DSP and having the ability to have Waves plugins uh, in multiple places uh, using the same DSP. So that that's kind of the future of where this is going. Um, so I, I hope that's a, 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 an overview that you guys can kind of see. Like I said, you should go to Waves Live uh, and waveslive.com and, and check out. There's more diagrams there and more information about uh, SoundGrid. Check that out. But I'd like to take some questions um, so that we can, uh, we can have some interaction here. That's what's so cool about this webinar thing. Um, Jeff Rake says, uh, when you use the term snapshot, is that the same thing Yamaha mixers call scenes? 
Yes, that's exactly right. Um, so um, when you create a scene in Yamaha land, um, you create a, a snapshot in, in Waves multi-rack. Uh, and with the, with the uh, MIDI uh, connection, you can make those two things talk to each other. So as you recall a scene in Yamaha land, it recalls a, a snapshot over it. It requires a bit of setup, but once you have the thing set up, um, recalling those scenes, uh, if you're used to that, um, is, is, uh, is an easy process and it, and it follows true. So I think that answers your question. Let's try another one. Uh, let's see. Uh, Kevin McCarthy. Ha! <laughs> Tater's on here. That's funny. Uh, where can you find the recommended switches that Waves wants you to, you to use? That's a great question. Um, this is uh, on the waveslive.com uh, website. There are, there are specs there for what they recommend that you use. Um, and what, what Tater is alluding to there is uh, that the, the switch itself is an off-the-shelf switch. Uh, but it requires that it's a gigabit switch. Um, we ran into where we were setting up a, a sound grid system uh, and the person had a fast ethernet uh, switch, which is not the same as a gigabit switch. Um, so uh, it's, uh, it's important that you kind of check uh, the Waves Live website and just make sure that you're using uh, the correct hardware uh, to get this thing going. So I think that answers the question. Let's see, Scott Perlman. I use uh, PA du jour a lot. What is the best system to carry? I'm not sure if you're talking about a uh, multi-rack system or if you're talking about PAs. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, the, the multi-rack system um, uh, has several different options as far as plugins go. Oh, multi-rack and interfaces is what he's saying. Great. Um, the... The system that, that I would recommend that you carry is um, what we've talked about here, which is two servers. And the reason that you have two servers is for redundancy. And what happens is if one server crashes, the other server uh, keeps on working and passes audio with no audio loss. Uh, so if one server were to crash, the other one takes over. Uh, that, that is just standard redundancy that we need to have in the live sound land. Uh, and they've built in a lot of safeguards in that regard. Uh, so uh, anyway, it's two two servers. Uh, uh, like I'll, I'll tell you exactly what what Tater's carrying around. It's two servers, a switch, uh, his own laptop, and uh, two WSG Y16 cards. Uh, and he carries that with him to whatever PM 5D that he goes, and it goes in a little flight case and it carries it with him. It's it's like carrying around all of your your outboard gear with you, uh, but it shows up in a you know in a six base little flight rack. Uh, and uh, you know the the plugins that you can purchase uh, are kind of up to you. They've they've come up with three different kind of bundles that they've created uh, for um, <clears throat> ease of use. Uh, and, you know, I mean, you can get into the high-end bundle, which has all the SSL stuff and all that kind of things. Um, spend, uh, spend some money. But in, in the end, if you really think about the ability to have 32 plugin, or sorry, 32 inserts and eight plugins on each one of those inserts uh, and having the, any amount of SSL mix bus compressors, for instance, or SSL channel or... Uh, Neve stuff. Um, the amount of money that you're spending on plugins is really uh, a lot cheaper, you know, thousands cheaper than you would have to spend in buying actual uh, analog units and the ease of use. Um, so, you know, I mean, uh, um, for an investment of, you know, uh, I don't even know what the list price stuff is, but, uh, you know, for an investment of 15 grand, uh, let's say you could have a fair amount of great plugins as well as all of this hardware and, uh, carry down carry that around wherever you go. that answered your question uh, Ricky Cook hi Ricky uh, 
Let's see, does adding additional networking hardware, such as an additional switch, does it add to latency? Okay, right now, adding an additional switch and all that kind of stuff is not really supported by the software, uh, and I would think that it would uh, some additional latency if it were supported. Anytime you add any additional hardware things into the situation, uh, it does become more latency, but... Like I said, uh, it's really designed, tailored for exactly what this is, which is you know, two servers, a single switch with everything plugged in. So, let's see. Got another question there. Um, is the Bob Wright says, is the front of house console becoming more of a control surface? Yes. Um, the, at this point, you know, with the technology that we have, um, it, it really is heading that direction. Uh, things are becoming more and more software based. Um, I was thinking the other day of, uh, how much hardware I'm carrying around with me. And when I, when I go to different bands and work with different bands and I'm not carrying a whole lot of hardware around with me, anymore. mainly a control surface. Um, currently, right now, I'm using a, a profile, um, and then a, a couple uh, IOs. Uh, it, you know, it's all gone digital land. It's all really headed that direction, um, which which I'm cool with. Um, it's pretty exciting the stuff that we can do in that land. Even with uh, some of these uh, models uh, that, uh, the, for instance, like Waves has built some uh, plug-in models that are modeled directly after previous uh, analog devices. Uh, so things that I used to know, like for an 1176, a Yuri 1176, I used to know uh, that analog device very, very well. Um, and now uh, having the ability to have it be a piece of software and have it actually really sound like the original analog unit is exciting. And not only that, having the ability to have 20 of them, um, I remember working in the studio, uh, I uh, we had two 1176s in the studio that I worked at in LA, uh, and we used to sit there and fight over what we were going to put through those 1176s, because we had two. So it was like, all right, uh, kick drum and maybe bass, you know, mic put through there. Uh, well, now, you know, with, with the advent of all this technology and, the, and it things being the control service and things being software... You know, I can put a 1176 on every channel <laughs> if I wanted to. Um, so it's an exciting time for us live sound guys. We can be uh, better at what we do and uh, live uh, sounding shows that sound just like the record uh, these days. Um, so, yeah, uh, it's an exciting time. Uh, question. Scott Perlman says, is it easy to go between platforms to design in Yamaha? Very easy. And here's why. Um, it's the whole preset thing. So if you're working on a, a digital design uh, console and uh, you, you know that the next day or coming up, you're going to be working on the Yamaha console, um, simply saving things to a USB key as presets, saving all of your plugins as presets um, is, uh, is a very simple process. And then loading those things into the multi-rack software uh, is very simple as well. Uh, it's all preset based. Um, I'll take that one step further. If you're working with multi-rack in several different formats, uh, not only do you have the ability to do presets uh, on individual plugins, but you can actually do a preset snapshot of the entire uh, multi-rack, the, the rack itself. Uh, which makes things pretty quick. So say, for instance, you had 32 racks in multi-rack. In each of those racks, you had six or seven uh, Waves plugins. Going into each individual plugin and storing all those presets might take you a little bit of time. But they've given you the ability to actually take a preset of the entire rack, uh, which is great uh, for traveling from, like, from multi-rack native, for instance, to multi-rack sound grid system. And then coming soon with the Digico, uh, you'll have the ability to have a USB key that's got all of your stuff. Um, so the answer is yes. It is very simple. 
Uh, let's see. Ricky Cook. After Digico, who will be next? Studer, maybe? That's a great question. Uh, I don't know the answer to that question. They are uh, communicating a bunch with um, different companies. Uh, and as multi-rack catches on uh, and people start to see how great it is, um, I think that more and more companies will come on board. I think there are some companies that are, are kind of waiting and seeing what happens with this. Um, but uh, I, I would venture to guess that we will start to see uh, all of this happening on various platforms coming soon. Um, now, I don't know if you know, I don't want to get too far into this, but the uh, multi-rack native is, this, is a piece of software that looks just like this multi-rack sound grid, um, but it uses a I.O. box, uh, uses the processing uh, within your uh, computer, um, your laptop. Uh, so it's an I.O. box in your laptop. And you have the ability to use Waves plugins on any platform with that I.O. box. So uh, for a student, for instance, you could come in and out of an AES uh, in and out of that, uh, any sort of IO box and Apogee, they support all kinds of ones. It's on the website, uh, RME or Apogee, anything with good converters. Um, and, uh, the ability to have, um, some waves plugins on any sort of platform is an exciting thing. What's great about that too, is that the multi-rack native software, the presets, and also the, so the actual session itself transfers into the multi-rack sound grid. So say for instance, one day you're on a, Studer desk using multi-rack native, uh, and the next day you're on a Yamaha desk with SoundGrid, uh, you can simply open up your session without having to import uh, presets. Um, so uh, the, I guess the answer to your question is, is that uh, coming soon there will be many different platforms and formats, uh, but uh, currently right now, uh, obviously it is um, and Digico. Uh, Camilo Riveros, I hope I said that right. Uh, I usually use DigiDesign D-Show system, but I only use the default plugins. If I like to use the Waves plugins, it's necessary to use the Y16 card, or can I use the default DigiDesign cards in the server I have, or it's necessary to use the server recommended for Waves. Okay, if you're talking about D-Show, that's a whole nother thing. Uh, D-Show, Waves plugins run within the system of of D show. Uh, so you do not require an external server or a card when you're talking about DigiDesign D show. Uh, it is already the ability to have Waves plugins is already exists within the software of D show. Uh, so require any of that stuff. Uh, it's a simple uh, purchase of uh, having the licenses on an iLock uh, and then downloading the venue version. Um, of those plugins uh, and installing them on your show and away you go. So uh, that's a simple process. Let's see here. Uh, Peter Moritz says, how big is the bandwidth in the sound grid area? 24 or 32 facing the headroom? Um, you know, this is a good question. Um, and... I believe uh, that it is 24-bit uh, technology, but you know what? I can't answer that with certainty. Um, I believe all the specs and all of that stuff is at Waves, uh, waveslive.com. Look into that. If you don't get the answer, uh, you can email me at poochatwaves.com uh, and I'll try to get you the, the answer to that. Regardless, uh, it is, uh, you know, Waves is, is one of those companies that, uh, you know, they just build plugins that sound great. Uh, and the reason that they do is they don't, they don't take, um, uh, they don't cut any corners. Um, they make sure that what they're creating is uh, uh, better sounding than, than a lot of what else is out there, uh, than most. Uh, and that's why a lot of us all use Waves is because they're just great sounding stuff. Um, and so uh, whatever it is, the technology that you're using behind the scenes there, uh, they haven't skimped on. Uh, and that's that carries true into the multi-rack. So um, anyway, I hope that answers your question. If you're, if you're 
didn't, uh, like I said, you can email me and we'll discuss it. Ricky Cook, however, those plugins for the D show need to be TDM, but SoundGrid only needs native plugins, just like standard multi rack. That is not true. Um, multi rack SoundGrid requires TDM plugins, uh, multi rack native requires native plugins. Uh, and the reason is, is that TDM plugins, the way that TDM plugins work, is they are ported to work on an external device, such as in SoundGrid, an external server. Uh, in D-Show, they're ported to work on external cards, uh, the uh, Motorola processor cards that DigiDesign built. Uh, so SoundGrid requires TDM plugins, and Multirack Native requires native plugins. When you buy TDM licenses, you get native uh, licenses. Uh, when you buy native licenses, you don't get TDM licenses. So it's best to buy TDM licenses uh, also they are more expensive, but it's best to buy that way because you end up with both licenses on that end. So if that answers your question. Kevin McCarthy says, is there going to be a pooch bundle coming out tailored to your choices of plugins? <laughs> yeah, I'm going to make the suck knob plugin. Um, that's that's my first my first. Uh, Pooch Signature Series plugin. Um, no, uh, they're not. They're not asking me to uh, to make uh, my own signature series. Um, and I wouldn't. I wouldn't uh, venture to say that I know anything about that kind of thing. Um, but um, you know, I have had some interaction with them about recommending what kind of plugins uh, that some of us live guys use. Uh, and kind of tailoring that into their live bundles that they are making right now. For instance, uh, one of the they asked me one of my favorite plugins, and I, I replied, one of my favorite plugins is a plugin called Renaissance Axe, uh, which was originally designed to be a guitar plugin. It's a very simple plugin. It's got you know threshold and gain. It's two knobs, uh, and also uh, there's uh, adjustment of the attack. Um, but it's a very simple plugin. But it was originally designed to be a guitar plugin. But I started putting it on some drums and trying it in different places, uh, and discovered that it was a great sounding plugin uh, in some other places besides where it was designed to be used. Um, so I really encourage you, just because it's labeled as a vocal plugin or labeled as a bass plugin, or you know, I mean, it's just like what we used to do in analog versions of that. I mean, you wouldn't just put a vocal through uh, a Uri 1176 or a TLA 100. No, you're going to put bass through it, or you're going to put a drum through it, or those kind of things. So just because a plugin is labeled as something, um, don't don't think that that's the only thing, man. Experiment with stuff, put stuff in, and that's what's great about plugins is it's quick. You you put something up, you try it, you mess around for a little bit. If it's not working, you move on. You move on to the next plugin. And the ability to do that, as opposed to the old way, you have to have someone repatch a piece of analog gear, is it's, uh, it's pretty amazing. So it, it's uh, it's pretty cool. Let's see. Bob Wright says, can you discuss the methods of controlling the dynamic mix with one mouse to control versus two hands? Um, I I don't think that. Well, I hope. <laughs> I hope that we won't be doing any mouse mixing in live land. Uh, I don't see any time in the future where we're not going to get rid of faders. Uh, now, you know, I'm in a, I'm a little bit of an old school guy, and so I'm maybe hanging on to technology that I'm familiar with. Um, you guys are familiar. Who knows, in the next couple of years, someone may come up with the best thing in the world, you know, some sort of controller that's that's amazing and revolutionizes what we do. Um, but, but for now, um, you know, using a mouse and mousing around and trying to control things, um, you know, resolution-wise and, and all of those kind of things are, are gets stuff out of control, I think. Uh, you still need to have the feeling, as being a mixer, I still need to have the feeling of, of touching some faders and, and uh, some knobs 
for adjusting EQ. It's just my personal opinion. Hope that answers your question. Okay, Pooch, it seems to be uh, all the questions for now. I'm going to give everyone one last shot. If you have any questions for Pooch, send them in. Going once, going twice. <laughs> all right. It looks like that concludes our webinar for today. Thank you, Pooch. Thank you all for taking part. We hope you enjoyed it. If you want to go back and view this webinar again, we will have it on our website, waves.com, within a week's time. For more information about SoundGrid, the Y16 card, Multirack, and all of our live tools, uh, please go to waveslive.com, as Pooch has said. And in fact, I'm going to put that link in the chat right now uh, because we did just redo the website and it looks pretty cool. Yes, you all go there for further information. Also, be sure to look out for our upcoming webinars on a variety of topics. They do sell out very quickly, so if you see one you like that you didn't get a ticket to, don't worry, as all of our webinars will be available on the Waves website about a week after they've aired. And you can view previous webinars right now by going to this other link that I am putting into the chat. There we go. So that's it. Thanks again, everybody. Have a good day and hope to see you at the next one. Thanks a lot, guys. I really appreciate you showing up.